that whole that whole universe. My kids go to Comic Con and they they love cosplay. So now you know, I I could I'd be delighted to be chased around by mad trekkies. I hear you can make a fortune out of it, but I didn't I appreciate can, time. I can get on a plane <laughs> by by five o'clock and I'll be out and I'm just kidding. I will chase you around. Yeah, I, yeah. In a trek out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can do this for you. Not a problem. Uh, Good. Excellent. How are you? Good to see you. I'm really good. Yeah, I'm really good. Do I look laggy again? I look strange. Or is that just me being drunk? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're drunk. That'd be so great. It makes me a little Even jealous. A bit early for me. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Okay. All right. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Um, there's no time zone in dystopia. It's all crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's like, it's I, like airports. It doesn't matter what time your flight is. You can just start drinking. Oh, that's yeah. a beautiful that's, quote. Yes, absolutely. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a Do you have a song like Do you have music like that that you're like, man, this is so good. I love it so much. I wish I could hear it for the first time again. Oh yeah, I would say. Uh, oh, I don't know where to start. Atomic by Blondie. <laughs> oh yes. And I remember that. I remember the video being shown on a big show over here called Top of the Pops, and uh, mm. they had this kind of dystopian didn't they um <laughs> post apocalyptic set for the video and she was in like i think in a plastic bin bag or something still looking you know like amazing even in a bin bag so i love that and also the first time i heard the pretenders i just oh. loved the pretenders i love the guitar the guitar sounds and everything yeah just loved it yeah absolutely yeah that's so true man yeah it's like i i remember uh the first time i heard heart and soul um just driving in a car uh, with my mom is probably on a, one of her cassette tapes or whatever. Actually, you know what? It was back in the day when like you would tape shit off the radio. So my mom used to make these mixtapes yeah. all the time. And I, I, cause I have like a, I have a weird connection to like certain songs and then um, immediately another song coming after it. You know what I mean? Yes, like because yeah, of the way, yeah. yeah. Cause we'd listen to it. So like, I just naturally follow it up with like another great 80 song or whatever. But yeah, I remember hearing that for the first time. And then adding it to literally every mixtape I've had, every CD, every MP3 player, you know, whatever it is. And then I listened to your whole album, loved it, you know, uh, completely. Just uh, you guys oh, have such a great, you. awesome sound. Well, yeah, well, we thought so. <laughs> well, we yeah. still do. <laughs> you do, yeah, yeah exactly. No, it was, uh, yeah, and Heart and Soul is my personal favorite of all of our hits. I mean, back home and in Europe. A song called China in Your Hand was the biggest hit. You know, we were number great. one here for five weeks and yep. number one in Holland for three weeks and Germany and all sorts of places, which was incredible. But as a songwriter, I was super proud of Heart and Soul. It is very different. It was at the time with the dual vocals and stuff. And yeah, I, like um, I just thought it sounded really cool. And if you hear it on the radio now, it still sounds really fresh. I think the it's still cool. And the production by Roy Thomas Baker, I think, is still really fresh. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing too, is like, if I, you know, play it for somebody that maybe, you know, uh, never heard it, they have, they have no idea it's not a new song because it just sounds like, yeah. Yeah. Cause also, do you think that like, yeah, it does sound contemporary too, but like there's the other yeah. thing too is uh, in the last, I don't know, like seven, seven years or so, I feel like that kind of eighties sound just, just worked its way into uh newer music anyway. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like a, a amalgamation of like the whole thing. I don't know if that's a word. It is now. No, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, there's quite a few artists that I think sort of um, honor the sounds of the eighties and they're interested in them. There's a great artist over here called LaRue. She, she hmm. really, has very 80 sound and i think yes. that the most popular exponent right now is probably the weekend yes his keyboard sounds are straight out of the 80s and yeah. his, his songs are fantastic really yeah. like him in fact my my son has just bought his album on vinyl oh nice and um i couldn't get over the price <laughs> they're like i don't 
I went to HMV with him the other day and he bought two albums. And the girl said, that'll be 70 pounds. And I went, are you fucking kidding me? It's like, <laughs> it's like sorry, my mind, I swear. Oh, no, you can swear. It's okay, um, you could on here. Double the price. I know, um, I, I know the, the vinyl's different now. It's a heavier grade. It is, it's different to our kind of vinyl. Yeah. But I could not get over the price. But what I loved was my 19-year-old son, without any prompting from me, really riffing on the artwork the sleeve notes that yep. the, the experience of pulling it out not scratching it and placing it on the turntable and and he got all the theater of it i didn't mm -hmm. have to tell him the story of what vinyl meant and for most of us you know it might be your pocket money or or your saturday job and you'd go down to, to your local record store and you'd flick through all the records and look and, and a lot of the um the covers were like uh, uh, works of art, weren't they? Not just photographs. Some, some yeah. artists would have some like cool photographer or cool artist do do their their, their artwork on the cover. And um, my son got all that without any prompting from me. He got how glorious it was. What a bigger experience it was to go buy your vinyl. Yeah, but it was definitely cheaper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, so no, crazy. It is. I love going into yeah. record stores. You know what it is too is like the community of a record store or even like an old video store, which they don't really have too much of anymore. Yes. But I remember I used to work at a Suncoast video and uh, I love, I mean, like it, you were just all surrounded by people who loved movies and music and nerdy shit. Oh, I miss Blockbuster so much. Yeah. We, yeah, we had too. a Blockbuster here in it, where I live. And when the kids were little, like they're 19 and 23 now, but I can't even remember when it closed down. It must be might be 10 years ago, but we would go and they'd pick their movie. My husband and I'd pick ours. Then you'd go around and go, what popcorn do you want? And mm -hmm. what, what terrible drink do you need? And it was a family event. It's a family trip down the road to pick all your stuff. And and I know everything's convenient now, but it that's gone. That community, yeah. as you were saying, that sense of, yeah. you know, oh, let's go, let's go do something, you know. It is, yeah. Because for a lot of us, it was our church. I mean, I wasn't a big, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a town square, you know, or anything like that. But like, you felt like uh, some kind of cool, you know, th the thing is, too, is like the people who worked in those stores, like it was their expertise. Like there wasn't anybody you couldn't walk up to and be like, hey, I'm looking for this movie or I'm, I heard this song. I don't know what it is where they wouldn't yeah. be like, oh, I hum it. OK, I know exactly what it is. And by the way, if you like that, you'll probably like these. And then you just pick up new shit. Yeah, yeah. A bit like that movie High Fidelity, was it? Was it yeah, uh, High Fidelity is a great movie. High Fidelity. That was um, great, yeah. Also, what's the one? Um, oh, my God. Empire Records. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I've seen that. Oh, yeah. you got to see Empire. No, Records. I know what you mean. Yeah, a lot of a lot of experiences have gone. And very soon, I'm convinced that we'll all end up. Remember that movie, Wally? -E? Oh yeah, of course. I, yeah. They're all I, like... I thought I thought that was prophetic. We'll just all be on these floating beds, and yep. you don't even turn your head. You don't even turn your head to look at the person you're talking to. You look straight ahead, and they're on your screen, and you're on their screen. Right. And all your yeah. food is pureed, and you you just press buttons, and that's life. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The metaverse. You know what is cool too? You're talking about yeah. the art. Have you seen the? I love that the albums now themselves have become artwork and stuff because I love opening an album and it's like got something printed on it or like a different color or there's a there's a band called the midnight and they always do something wild with their their actual record on the inside like not only the artwork on the outside but like the actual record itself but the vinyl yeah, oh the yeah, vinyl. yeah yeah well yeah. my husband has um he my husband was a massive punk you know back in the 70s here in the uk mm -hmm. and we had this performance artist he's, he's still working now called john cooper clark oh nice and he had this big he had a big hit with, um, you have to go find it. It's called I Married an Alien from Outer Space. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> like, he's a, he's a poet. He's a poet. He's a punk poet. He's amazing. That's great. And when Dylan Dylan treated him, bought himself this new deck and started collecting vinyl, Richard went and found his records. And he's got, it's a triangular seven inch. Wow. So it's wow. a massive orange triangle, but clearly big enough for the diameter of the triangle to contain the circle that would be the, the, the right single, right you know. yes yeah. so we got that out and showed it to dylan and he, he was just kind of you couldn't believe it you know wow. so people were doing crazy things with vinyl even even back like in the early yeah. 80s late 70s so yeah, yeah. I, but i know what you mean there's some now that they're putting like um multi colors and artwork and everything they're very beautiful yeah yeah i actually started so i started as a in as a dj young but when i started it was all vinyl 
So it was such yeah. a different animal because you couldn't stay current without spending almost everything you made every week on vinyl. <laughs> yes. So we would constantly just be turning it over. And I feel like there was such a change when it changed to where everybody had access to music and it wasn't something they could just download it on a computer. It took away from like you putting your time in and like really having to perfect your craft of playing music. And it was so, it's such a different. Definitely. Animal. Yeah, and obviously, you know, people are still listening to the music, still dancing to it, so that the, they end yeah. up getting the thing that they want. But you yeah. really have to learn your stuff, especially working with vinyl, where to drop the needle and not scratch your record yeah. and stuff. You know, and for me, for me, um, when I started in recording studios, it was all um, tape. You know, it wasn't yep. digital recording; it was all tape. And we would have yeah. a thing called the two-inch master, so it was a tape, literally two inches wide. You know, and all your hard work months and months sometimes you know with some bands years of recording go onto that two inch tape before you spool it off onto the quarter inch which is you know um the copy and uh that's where you do all the mastering from but the guys were so expert sometimes you'd want to edit the master and if they fucked that up that was your recording down the drain and they would edit wow. the master you know with um, uh, a stanley blade and they had these funny little uh, grips where they'd grip the tape and they'd just go and they'd t turn the tape and they could hear the they'd go whoop 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 and they could hear where the <laughs> bass drum was and go yep. right that's the edit point and we'd, we'd all go Aah! and they'd go <laughs> like that and cut it splice <laughs> it back together with some sticky and that and it was, they were just fantastic and you learn you know now with, with digital editing you just cut and paste it's like an email yeah. you know if we decide we're not happy with a song we just you do it with with everything now don't you? you just cut and paste it move the yep. voice around move the drums around move. but then it was literally a piece of tape and a razor blade and that's how you edited but wow. they were fantastically um expert at it i feel bad complaining about editing yeah. shit now because i am like i'm like literally just moving shit <laughs> digitally on a screen and i'm like oh my god this takes forever and i can't even imagine having to do it with a razor blade and what if you and you fuck it up that's it that's it. You know, you know, you, some people shoot you. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. I can't even imagine. Um, I'm sure you get this. I, I also, the other thing that when I was a kid, the, the name to pal, uh, I just love that it's named after it's Spock's mother, right. And Star Trek. It wasn't his mom. Um, I, I wasn't a Trekkie like with a capital T. I just ha happened to watch it. I liked it. Yeah. And yeah, I did lift the name from the show because I thought it was a, a cool name. So great. But, um, I thought she, I thought she was his paternal grandmother, but oh, grandmother. I don't think that's correct. I, I don't think they were related. I think they were just both Vulcan. Uh, but I do know <laughs> no. that she, they were just good she friends. Was, um, she, yeah, she was a high priestess and she mm -hmm. a Vulcan high priestess and she sat on the Intergalactic Council. Oh, wow. So there you go. Yeah, and the episode great. was called Am Amok Time. I have um, I have been educated by my Trekkie nice. fans. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, did they, have you gotten a lot of feedback from the Trekkies? Oh, back in the day, yes, but particularly when we were out in the States. And I have to say that this is 30 years before Comic-Con was with us. And now all the biggest stars in the world will go to a Comic-Con and, and um, promote their latest sci-fi thing weren't they yeah back absolutely. then um i was a bit i was a bit concerned that all these weird nerdy people in homemade star trek <laughs> outfits with pointy <laughs> plastic ears were chasing me around america i thought that they were going to ruin my cool not that, that not that i ever had any but <laughs> but now of course that whole that whole universe my kids go to comic con and they, they love cosplay so now you know i i could I'd be delighted to be chased around by mad Trekkies. I hear you can make a fortune out of it, but I didn't appreciate I can, that at the time. I can get on a plane <laughs> by by five o'clock and I'll be out and I'm just kidding. I will chase you around yeah, I, yeah. in a Trek out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can do this for you. It's not a problem. Um, yeah, that's great. Were you, I mean, so when, when you started out though, was it a goal to get to the US? Was it like, you know, did you guys care too much about doing the States or or was it just like a natural progression? A little bit of both. I, I was a big US fan. I, I loved American music, American movies. And um, yeah, so I thought hopefully one day I'll get there. But to start with, it was those progressive steps, like you say, you know, um, just let's get a record deal. Let, yeah. Let's just see if we can get one single, let one single away. 
and then the the show I mentioned earlier um top of the pops it's it's gone now but it was a, a national institution it began since the 60s it probably ended maybe 10 years ago and it it was the show there wasn't the choice you know there wasn't like 24 MTV channels it was top of the pops reign mm -hmm. supreme for for donkey's years so let to get on top of the pops was like a big box tick bucket list thing so did right. that you know then you know have an album and it all started to fall into place but it didn't go smoothly um it was a long time coming you know i didn't start singing till i was 22 didn't okay. decide to try it till i was that age and then by the time i got decent management i was like 26 oh wow and then by the time i was recording um we were in a, a a big studio called Royal Recorders, which was in Wisconsin, a couple of hours out of Chicago with Roy Thomas Baker. I was 28. I was like wow. geriatric, you know, by <laughs> pop, pop, by pop standards. standards. Yeah. Yeah. So it had taken um, me and my partner, um, Ron Rogers, a, a long time to get any record company interest because a lot of people would sniff around and we had showcases with various labels and mm -hmm. they were like, yeah, we like this. We're, like, we're not sure. We're not sure. And then it took ages until Virgin went, yeah, yeah, let's do this. You know, so wow. it, took, it took a long time. And then everybody thought we were an overnight success. So they, they don't know the half of it, you know, and back right. then no internet, no YouTube channel, nothing like that. You literally had to get in a van, play somewhere, hope some people turned up. And if you built up a local following, try and get on the local radio station, which we did, try and get on the local TV, which we did. And then I lived in Shropshire, which is a rural county. So it's like mm -hmm. living in Milwaukee or something like that, you know? Okay. And so um, we were miles from London, miles from Liverpool, miles from Manchester. We weren't living in a big city with a hip scene. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was hard to get record camp, hard to just know where they were. <laughs> yeah. And finally, you know, we started slapping down to London and some of us had jobs so we, we'd finish work at six get down to London play in some pub by 9 30 10 p.m you know it was wow. sort of three hours drive away and hope that the A&R guy you'd reached out to would come see you and most of the time they mm -hmm. didn't you know it's a long 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 hard road and then finally we clicked with the right A&R guy who got us and so then we were on our way that's incredible um, what were you like when you were, when you were younger, before you started singing and stuff, was it always your passion to be in a band, to be a solo artist, or did you have something else completely in mind? I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was kind of, as a very young child, I was, I was sort of precocious. I would tap dance and sing on the bus and stuff. And, you know, I was always showing off and things like that. And mm -hmm. I came from a sort of not professional musical background, but a lot of music in my family. My dad was a great piano player. My mom nice. was a great singer. You know, um, I had a one branch of the family in Canada, apparently where were professional singers. It was all like zooming around the gene pool. And then, um, but it wasn't anything that anybody thought would be a career. I think we were more focused on more practical ways. So I went to mm. over here, what we call grammar school. You pass this exam called your 11 plus age 11. And you, you go into, you know, a school where they consider you to be reasonably clever and you get funneled into that sort of maths, chemistry, biology, that kind of thing. Right. But I just, I just must've had a lucky day the day I passed my 11 plus, cause I was such a fish out of water in that school. It was, so academic and I wasn't you know so I didn't really know what to do with myself at all and then um I fluffed my exams so we had these things called a levels I don't know what it would be like end of high school exams for you guys before you go off into university right so I I screwed them up right royally and so I just ended up bumming around au pairing traveling working in bars that kind of thing you know nice. and then when I was 22 uh, I got this I was actually on unemployment and we had this thing called the YTS scheme, which was youth training services. And mm -hmm. the, the unemployment people said, Oh, you know, you're going to, we're going to put you on this team. And it was a museum helping the art team put the installations into a museum. Oh, that's cool. And me and a friend went, and again, I was a bit, I don't know what I'm doing. Who am I? Where do I fit in? And I got fascinated by the art team because they were all post-grad artists. They're amazing. So I decided to try and get into art college. And I did. I, I was okay at, at, at art at school. So I cobbled together a bit of a portfolio, got an interview, 
got into the Wakeman School of Art in Shrewsbury in Shropshire. Wow. And in that in, in that environment, I began to meet a different kind of person, um, a more artistic, eccentric, diverse, crazy people, as opposed to the kind of straightforward academic girls I've gone to school with, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was always singing along to the radio and in the studio and stuff. And someone said, why don't you just stop annoying us all and go and join a band, you know? And then she said, look, I'm going to this party at the weekend. A friend of mine's looking for a singer. You do have a really good voice. You should come with me. And I went along and I, I, I met this guy, Julian, and I auditioned for his band and it was a local band. And that was me in a band. Wow. So long answer to your story is I know I didn't have this you know passion all I knew was I never seemed to fit into anything conventional all I knew was where I didn't belong wow but it took me ages to figure out that that's where I belonged you know yeah because nobody ever told me that I could belong there they just right. said oh she's got a nice little voice hasn't she anyway you know nobody ever <laughs> said well, you should do something with that you know <laughs> yeah you're like the B girl in the uh, um, Oasis video. No rain. You Am ever I? See that? <laughs> yeah, when she did, when uh, she finally finds her B time, people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was more a case of a process of elimination, really, than a knowledge of what I could do. You know, that's awesome. That's a great way to find out, though. I mean, that's a nice. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, there's there's worse ways to find out who you are and what you want to do with your life. So that's actually kind of guess, cool that you got to I try was... a multitude of things. You know what I mean? Like, like being a lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more of was an artist always... too, because that's pretty great. <laughs> I was always, I, I was okay. I was never going to kind of, you know, set the world on fire, but I did enjoy the, it's called foundation course, you know, so you go through all the different things like photography, print, fine arts, yeah. all sorts of things. Yeah. I really loved it. And I just loved the freedom of that kind of study. But all the jobs I had, my my job to boost my student grant was I was um, a lifeguard and oh, nice. um, at the local swimming pool. And uh, I was always so hungover that if anyone, <laughs> you know, needed help, I'd have just gone down with them. I used to be like linked up against the wall like this at like 7 a.m. because we'd all been out party. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, my God. That was fucking hilarious. Yeah, my friends and I used to work at a beach and we had a, uh, you know, just surrounded by lifeguards and everybody else too. And it would be the same thing because Memorial Day weekend would roll around and we would just be like, we knew we had yeah. to work at like seven o'clock in the morning the next day, but we would yeah. still go out and get fucking plastered and then like kind of like show Absolutely. up the next day. Yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah. God, I hope nobody's I drowning. Yeah. <laughs> and also in an enclosed swimming pool, you know, they're really hot and humid, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that would make your, your hangover so much worse. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a Nazi with my whistle. I was so hungover <laughs> and bent. <laughs> Stop enjoying yourselves. <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> oh, God. That's great. <laughs> Blowing into it. I quit. <laughs> yeah. I'm giving my two weeks. <laughs> They're like, all right, you yeah. don't have to blow the whistle for that. Just tell us. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep, yeah. Do you, uh, w was there somebody that you were inspired by immediately to like, you know, musically? I know you mentioned Blondie and the Pretenders and stuff, but was there like somebody maybe that you kind of emulated in the beginning when you started singing? No one specifically, but I, my dad's record collection was full of divas. Ooh. And my mum and dad loved their music and they were always playing music constantly. And my dad, my mum would be more the kind of, she liked soul and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Tamla. My dad would have a lot of uh, Barbara Streisand, Shirley Bassey, Ella Fitzgerald, oh, wow. uh, Dina Washington. Wow. Um, and he loved opera. He loved opera. He loved big arias. You know, he, he always, uh, when he, at his funeral, we played... Pavarotti's Ness and Dorma, which he absolutely mm -hmm. loved. So I was very influenced, um, high drama, I think, big songs, big voice, you know, I wasn't, I'm not subtle when I sing. And so I think the right. style more than a particular um, individual, you know, and then when I sort of developed my own taste, um, yeah, Blondie and uh, funnily enough, I was, do you know what Northern Soul is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I was big into Northern Soul, big into my dance, and I was late 70s, big into disco, 
really loved dancing. Oh, wow. And then by the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, I was getting in more into rock. And that's when, you know, I just loved, I loved Debbie Harry and I loved Chrissy Hine because they were such strong women mm-hmm. in a very yeah. male orientated, you know, part of the, the industry. Yeah. And I, I just loved their strength as well as their talent. So they were big influences on me for sure. Did you ever wind up meeting them? I met Debbie briefly. We were doing um, a big radio station um, thing in Atlanta. And there was her and me and a couple of our other artists. I think we all had songs out. And you, we just went on stage and went, hey, and you know, said hi to the fans and chatted with whoever the DJ was. And I was about four people away from her. And mm-hmm. um, I just, you know, I didn't have the courage to go and go and fangirl her. I was just going, oh, my God. <laughs> but she was uh still she was gorgeous and very Mm. cool just hanging out with everybody you know just chatting that's awesome yeah i know you wrote the uh the songs with your partner at the time too um but were you more lyrically inclined like first or were you did you like hear music in your head and then get that kind of down and then write the lyrics what was your process like uh, a little bit of both. Um, I'm not a very good musician. I play a little bit of piano. I'm enough play in, enough by ear to block out chords and know where I want the melody to go. But yeah, often right. I'll, I will get um, just a little tune in my head and mm. fiddle around with yep. that and find some words that fit in. So it would be music and lyrics. Um, China in Your Hand was definitely a story first because yeah. I, I wrote that after watching a documentary about mary shelley writing the book of frankenstein oh wow and um she was married to percy Bysshe shelley and they were big friends with lord byron and all the poets and the intellectuals of the day and when Mm. she was age 19 she had this massive pulp hit fiction with with frankenstein and it caused a lot of jealousy Mm. and arguments in her in her set Mm -hmm. and then of course you know the sad story of frankenstein himself where he creates you know, he plays God and creates man in his own image. And it's, yeah, it's, I don't, the book's amazing. I don't think anybody's ever captured what a sad story it is in any movie. It's always a bit clunky. It's a monster. It's a monster. Yeah. But, you know, it was really sad. So, but anyway, my point for the song was it's a story within a story, which is, you know, so the lyrics are it was a theme she had on a scheme he had. So it was her book, mm-hmm. Dr. Frankenstein's, you know, experiment and and be careful what you wish for because yeah. sometimes when your dreams come true they spin yeah. out of control you know so that was a story and um heart and soul was definitely that was a new toy we had a new keyboard it might have been a jx3p oh wow and ronnie ronnie was mucking around it had a sequencer in it so a sequencer is um something that you play some notes and then you press a button and it loops and it just keeps playing. Mm-hmm. So you can just leave that to play itself while you muck about on a guitar or something over the top of it, you know. Right. So Ron put this um, bomb, 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 bomb into, mm-hmm. the, into the keyboard and just kept that sequencing. And then he starts going, ba, 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 and you know, because he's the musician. And I was just going, la, da, 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 da. So I got a, I got a melody across the top of that. Mm-hmm. And then I found a story to tell, work it into the melody. And then we we had gaps and we tried percussion in the gaps. And then we tried, we decided we wanted words to fill in the gaps, percussive words. So we, we came up with a rap vocal. Right. So that grew a different way. So, um, yeah, but I'm not a musician, so I would never sit down and start knocking out chords. I've usually got some little notes floating around in my head or some mm-hmm. words, but you know, it can be each can be the other way around depending you know yeah is it is it hard to build a relationship when you're like with um trying to explain like what you hear in your head musically to somebody or like how long does that take or did you guys get it like kind of instantly what how do you mean between me and ron yeah 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 like i mean because i always wanted the same thing like some like if, how would i describe what i'm hearing musically in my head to a musician like do they pick up on it easily like oh, oh I-, I think i know what you're talking about 
Well, like I say, I, I do have good relative pitch, so mm -hmm. um, I can, although I can't play very well, so I can go, no, no, not that, no, no that one, that one, that one. So ah, gotcha. go, da, da, and then an adept musician will quickly pick up what I'm saying. Or I'll reference a song. I'll say, you know, I I want the vibe from blah, and we'll listen to mm -hmm. it together and and sort of, you know, sort of take take a mood from another song maybe. Um, but I can sit down in the piano and, and block out and I can say what style I want. And um, Ronnie and I were very um, simpatico, you know, and he, he, although we're not personally involved anymore, we still work together right. all the time. And, and we've put a few tunes out the last couple of years, just download singles and he's back in the band. So yeah. we just have always clicked and I'm not really as comfortable with anybody else as I am with him, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I tried, you know, when the, when the band broke up and he and I broke up, I tried to, to go song, like get me a publisher and send me off songwriting. And I just, I just didn't click with other Wasn't people or have the call or yeah, pertinent to your, to your question have, cause I'm not a very adept musician. I mm. didn't have the confidence cause I couldn't um, suddenly play something on the piano and start the song that, you know, Ronnie understands what I mean. Right. And my other guitarist, James, James Ashby, understands what I mean when I sort mm. of give my cack handed explanations of how I think it should go, you know. Yeah. But we get there. But, you know, I'm in awe of professional songwriters like these teams that write for, you know, or like um, Sia, for example. I think she's an amazingly efficient songwriter. Or the guys right. down in Nashville where they all just knock out and they don't. Of course, they have numbers, don't they? They they, they write yeah. numbers. That's three, three to the five to the seven to the. I I sell one of my kids to be able to do that, but I just can't. So right. I ended up, I suppose, making my world a little smaller and working with people that understand me. Yeah, that's awesome, though. That's cool because it's better to know what you exactly what what you know, you know, what you're comfortable working with, than kind of like trying to flounder and yeah. push yourself into something you have no idea, you know um exactly it, yeah I out of had, depth. yeah 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 exactly why why suffer that way yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. um <laughs> what is it is it cool like it's got to be awesome to have hits both from like you know the uk where you guys are from and then also in the us but did you ever like did you ever focus too much on maybe like god why did this not hit back home like did that did that feel a little weirder to you that like like the us embraced you know a song more than like the uk may have Oh, yeah. Well, so Heart and Soul got released in the UK mm -hmm. first and was a huge flop. It just popped into the top 100 and flew right. straight out again. And we thought everything was over because the music business is a really cutthroat business. You know, if you're not making the money, they they get rid of you pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, and uh, David Betteridge, who was RMD in the UK, he never liked Roy's mixes. They had huge arguments about them. So when it was a flop, he went, see, I told you it's not right. Blah, blah, blah. blah all that money. Wow. No, 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 you know, <laughs> thank the Lord. Two things happened kind of simultaneously. Um, Virgin America really liked it and started to push it. And it started getting a lot of play. Mm -hmm. um, MTV liked the the video, and it quickly got onto heavy rotation. So that was amazing. Great video. And then it is, and then back back home, a very cool jeans company called Pepe Jeans used it in their cinema um, advertising campaign. Mm. So we we got a reprieve. So it went to number four in the Billboard chart and stayed there for like months it, wow. you know it used to go down the chart and up, up a little bit and down and up a little bit it was quite fantastic mm -hmm. and then we got a reprieve at home and it got re-released and also went to number four in the uk which was great wow. so yeah and then then we were back on track but i know what you mean yeah but i i, I kind of was disappointed but the american market is such an important market that when it started flying up the billboard chart, it was <laughs> it was a pretty good consolation prize, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, bye, New York, here I come. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we had a we had um um John Penny on from uh um oh my god, Ned's Atomic Dustbin. I don't know if you know that that band. Um but he was kind of I know talking the name, but I don't I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. He he was kind of talking about um, you know for some reason the UK being a really like uh, a picky market for like songs. Like if they, if you're from the UK and if they either like you or fucking hate you, do you feel the same way? Did you feel like less embraced maybe 
Or, or uh, why is that? Because like it does seem like with, to start with. Well, I don't know. I had the reverse experience because in the states, after Heart and Soul, they never got anything we ever did again. Like wow. um, Bridge of Spies was um, a flop. They released that. I, they didn't like China in Your Hand. They never released it. And the label wow. never released Rage, our second album, which was a platinum album over here. Holy so shit. I had the reverse. Yeah, I had the rev Our second album was a platinum album. Our first album was quadruple platinum. Um, so I had the reverse experience. And as it was explained to me, and I'm happy to be um, corrected if somebody was, um, you know, bullshitting me or trying to make, <laughs> make it easier for me to take. Because Heart and Soul was a pop rap song, but, you know, mm -hmm. it was perceived as this sort of pop rap song. Yeah. And then China in Your Hands, this big ballad, and everything else on the album is quite rocky. And back then, I don't know if it's the same now, they liked you in your little box. So it was like, well, who are you? And the, the radio stations were going, well, that's nothing like Heart and Soul. Why would we play that? Right. You know, so we didn't fit. We, we were eclectic. Mm -hmm. We're a very eclectic band with the songs differ from each other greatly. And here at home, they liked that. But in America, they didn't. It, it was too different. So, wow. you know, we never got another one away. Mm -hmm. That's shitty of us. I had no idea. <laughs> That's really interesting, though, right? Yeah. I feel like it's almost like that yeah. whole TikTok experience where if you do one thing on TikTok, you need to keep repeating that thing over and over and over and over and different in, in slight variances for your for your followers to they want to digest yeah. almost the same thing over and over and i feel like that's executives yeah, but we probably never... just like that's what we want yeah well, uh, uh, executives or even whoever did the you know the, the the heads of playlists at the radio yeah because obviously you know they put out they, they released bridge of spies and we did a great little video for that and on the road video mm -hmm. yeah. and nobody was interested in it wouldn't play it that's not heart and soul not playing it and then they quickly you get dumped so quick i can't tell you you know one minute you're everybody's darling and the next minute i was checking my phone to see if it was disconnected because it just stopped ringing wow. <laughs> oh my <Hello>? god yeah. <laughs> it's just ringing like every 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> holy shit that's brutal yeah. um yeah it was is. it when you guys got that commercial the, the song in your commercial did somebody reach out to you and they're like hey we want to use your song or you just wake up the next morning and you're like holy shit we're in a commercial um, no, they have to get permission from your publisher. They don't tend to come to you. They'll go to you to your publisher. So, um, right. and you know, you get to you get to give approval and stuff. Oh, you do. Okay. We, so I was gonna say, how did you guys did. find out? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. They just said, well, I think from from that particular one, the label said, listen, do this, let it happen. You know, because um, people, you could be quite picky back then when we were all precious about what we did, about. Um, where our songs would get used. There was a great yeah. story where the police um, refused to let their song "Don't Stand So Close to Me" be on a deodorant advert. Yeah, because they found, yeah. you know, they found it. It was insulting to their art. They probably wouldn't care now. It's funny, you know. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> turning down, turning down um, over here in the UK. There's um, part. There's a big part of the country. They they do pottery and ceramics and stuff. Mm. And uh, one pottery company wanted to use China in your hand. As, and I was like, oh, no, it's my art. <laughs> Not spending cups and saucers. You know, and now, of course, I'd be like, yeah, anything, <laughs> don't care. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, you're like, whoever hears yeah, the so they song, it's fine. You. Yeah, so they approach you. So um, do you know a band called, is it Oberhofer? Yeah. Very bit, yes. Is it Oberhaus or Oberhofer? Oberhofer. Oberhofer. Which over half a year, so um, he's doing a thing, he's covered Heart and Soul, and it was in um, a song called T uh, a film called Table 19 a couple of years ago. And now oh, no. we just got an email from Universal saying uh, they want it in the Andy Warhol diaries, oh, but it's nice. his version, not mine. Yeah, uh, it's his version, uh, not mine, but that's fine, you know. Yeah, do you yeah, like do you like when cool. people cover yeah. your music? Uh, yeah, I'm always flattered. Don't necessarily right. always like what they do with it, but I like what Oberhof <laughs> does. He's, he's really very cool. But there were some very odd things I've heard, and I, you always have to be uh, gracious. I think that somebody's you know taken an interest. Right. <laughs> it's it's really particular. Like I'll be in a grocery store or something like that, and they'll like 
you know, I'll, I'll hear a cover of some 80 song that I love or whatever. And I'm just like, why wouldn't you just play the fucking original instead of like, yeah. <laughs> like, why does it have to be, you know, oh, uh, yeah. butchered? Yeah. 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 Well, actually, it's, it's more interesting when they've really, really ruined it in a, in a spectacularly different way rather than <laughs> right now in all the adverts, right? They've got. There's this vogue for very gentle singing. Oh, and so yeah. they'll play some song by, mm. I don't know, Metallica, you know, Exit Light and Tonight. <laughs> and then they'll put it on an advert and just think yeah. that that is cool and it's not. You know? So yeah, yeah. it's better when yeah. they really, really fuck it up than try and yes. do this kind of moody adaptation I, I, I love when there's some creepy movie coming out and they and they'll just get like this really normally upbeat song and then they'll just give it to lana del rey and I'm like can you slow it down and yeah, make it really yeah. creepy and completely unappealing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like i know yeah, I, I know I that. definitely that that's what i'm talking about for sure yeah. yeah and i love lana del rey by the way i just don't yeah. but i think it is kind of funny yeah. that they'll like just take a <laughs> i'm like just write a new fucking song if you want something creepy why do you have to turn pinocchio into a frightening thing or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, there goes my childhood. What the fuck? <laughs> I know. They can't leave yeah. anything alone these days, can they? It's terrible. No, <laughs> I know. It's so bad. There's there's a band. Oh, my God. There was a, a horror movie. I think it was called Your Next. I love horror movies, by the way. It's like one of my I, I just I really like I want to be scared. And I just feel like I'm so desensitized. I, I can't. I can't. I'm, oh, really? I get the cushion. Yeah, I tell you what I watched oh. just recently, and it wasn't um, terrible name. It's called Old. Oh, I saw M. it too. Night, M Night Shyamalan. I, Shyamalan. Dong, I can never pronounce. <laughs> yeah, M Night Shyamalan. <laughs> and that I, I was like, after a while, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, the baby. I knew the baby was going to die. I knew that. I knew that oh. she was going to get pregnant. She yeah. was going to have a, a gestation period of four minutes. The baby would come out and the baby would die straight away. I just knew that. I, I could figure, I figured it all out. Yeah, Sorry, absolutely. Spoilers if you haven't seen and, it. And it's, <laughs> no, no, no. But and, and, and in spite of it's, it's fine. I don't think anybody's watching it. But there's like, but it is one of those things where like it kept me like, even though I, I was saying thing, I could tell what was going to happen, but I still felt like heart palpitations as it was going on because you were experiencing yeah. it in real time. Yeah. I know, but I no, I can't watch a horror movie, and and um, well, everybody knows how movies are made now because there's all the behind the scenes additional footage anyway. But I've I've been on video sets, I've I've had small cameo parts in tele tele and TV yes. and film. I know, Trigger I know TV. how it works, and still I'm frightened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> still, I know there's cameras everywhere, and there's there's a focus, there's a grip and a focus puller, and if you <laughs> widen the shot, there's fifty more people around that bed. But I'm still frightened. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know it's a good movie. There, so the, the, the movie exactly. I saw was called You're Next, and there was a song in it that they played on a fucking loop while this these people in this house were just getting fucking murdered, right? And I swear to God, though, it took me it took me out of it in the best way. I'd never heard the song before, and it was by a band called the the Dwight Twidley Band. Do you know them? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> but they're from the fucking 70s. And and the song is called um, Looking for the Magic. And I swear to God, it may. I, I was the only one laughing in the theater. These people are getting slaughtered, and then they played this fucking. Off it's a good song, by the way. It's like a one hit wonder <laughs> by by these two dudes who look like they're out of the seven. You know, whatever. But there's so they're they're playing this song, and I I swear to God, I, tears in my eyes, laughing hysterically, could not control myself. And everyone's like, "Will you shut the fuck <laughs> shut up?" I'm like, "This is amazing. Do you not get this?" And I and I downloaded it, and I and every time that song comes on when I'm in my car, I just I just laugh and i picture that scene so and that's it's good probably thing. i should yeah. probably see somebody yeah uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty sure i'm pretty sure yeah, I, can't, I like i like um sort of courtroom dramas and things like um mm. oh i love it i loved it when harrison ford was in his heyday and he was either jack ryan or the president of the united states and you knew everything was gonna be okay yeah you know yeah you just knew it. <laughs> and I also loved uh, House of Cards. Love oh, that. That's my Joe. kind of like ho home le Homeland. Homeland was That's so good. Thing. Oh, my God. That was yeah. a great fucking And I show. kind of, you know, and, and you kind of, um, 
you don't know what to do with yourself when the series was over. And when Homeland was on, this is before um, you could stream all the episodes, you know, when it first came out. Oh, you sure, have to yeah. wait till next week to get, yeah. Right. And it really had a focus to your week and something to look forward to. And then when it was over, you just like, I say, but when I got to the end of, um, oh, hang on, came into my head and went straight out again. <laughs> <laughs> New or old? The, dr the drug thing, Brian Cranston, you oh, know. Um, yeah, it's, um, um, oh my God, I got it. Brian Cranston is great in it. It's, um, you know, it's uh, the meth one, the meth show. Um, Breaking yeah. Bad. Breaking Something Bad. Violent. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to get there. There's no need to That's rush uh, Yeah, Breaking Bad. Richard and I just did not know what to do with ourselves when we'd finished it. We were just like, should we go to bed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is, it is so terrible when shows thing, like... Yeah. Yeah. When, when shows are really well written like that and they're on for a long period of time, you get so connected to those people when you don't see them regularly. You're like, it's like your family yeah. like left you or, you know, you've yeah. been abandoned. Oh, I'm, I'm such a Frasier nerd oh, that my so kids are really worried about me because I talk about them like I know them. <laughs> and something will happen in your day and I'll go, ah, oh, it reminds me of when Niall said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like they're real and <laughs> my kids are really worried about me you know, great philosophy for life in that show i think <laughs> oh yeah that's a good that is a that's like one of the classic fucking shows of all time it's the best frazier it? it, it's on all... every morning here in the uk it's oh, still nice. on every morning and i think i'd be a, wow. a little i taped it just in case they stop showing it, because I don't quite know how I'll be if I know it's not there. <laughs> I I absolutely there's a bunch of shows like that that I love comfort wise. One of my favorite shows is Scrubs. I don't know if you got into that, um, but it's like, watch it all the time. Oh, isn't it one of the best fucking shows ever? Brilliantly written. We yeah. watched it yesterday. Watched an episode yesterday, and I took the piss out of my kids because they think that they're real. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. They think they I are mean, their friends, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. It's so my my friends and I love that show. My friend and I joke around all the time where they're like, uh, that show taught me how to feel. <laughs> so up until yeah. then, you know, feel it's what? one of the feel like, any, any, it's one of the few it's one of the few shows where it's like you're crying, laughing, and then within a like a minute, something emotional happens and I'm just also just sobbing in general. It's pathos, isn't it? It's called pathos. Yes. And also yeah. when when they started to filter in the the guy from Men at Work, he'd just be singing oh, Colin in the background Hay. of one of the yeah. episodes. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. We had Colin Absolutely Hay fabulous. on. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had Colin Hay on the show and I asked him how he wound up being incorporated with Scrubs. And he he was it was really really fucking funny because he said he was at a like a kind of like a Hollywood party or whatever and Zach Braff yeah. had walked up to him and he's like, "Hey, um, how come people like I, I love your music? How come you're not more you know well known?" And he was like, "I don't know, guy. Like, <laughs> like, I, like you fucking tell me. I have no idea." And and basically, yeah. uh, Zach was like, "Listen, I just got I'm the I'm the lead in in this new show. Um, I'd love to you know get some of your songs there." And Colin A was like, "Yeah, no. Why don't you do that? <laughs> like, please, <laughs> please. Why don't you fucking do that?" Um, and then he introduced him to Bill Lawrence or whatever, and, and Bill like fell in love with his music and shit, and that's just how they wound up doing it. But it's just beautiful the way they fold him into the episode. It's like yeah. some kind of narrator or um, noises off type character, you know. I, th yeah. I just think it's fabulous. And Seinfeld. Oh, another yeah. Do you like Seinfeld? I love Seinfeld. And, Cur and Curb. And, and Curb. Curb. Yep. Oh, fucking hell. One of my favorite episodes in Curb is um, he's behind a woman in the um, ice cream parlor. Hey, and, yes. you know, you can have a little, sa a little sample in the little pot. Mm -hmm. And she samples like 20. So he's into the etiquette of, you know, when should you stop sampling? Right. One or two and then buy something and let the next person come forward. But she keeps picking another flavor. And another mm -hmm. flavor. It's so good. <laughs> And they make, you know, they it's like Seinfeld. It's the show about nothing. Just yeah. the shit yep. that winds you up. The nothing shit that winds you up on, a, on your daily life, you know. And how we fun. all wish we could react if we were that person. We're, we're that person on the inside, but we yeah. can't do any of that on the outside. Mm. Yeah. I, I really In hope fact, that. Today... I... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, 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 you. I was going to say today I, I was in the car and um, we were at the traffic lights and there was loads of cars stopped in front of us. Couldn't figure out why. Mm. And I'm going, come on, come on, hurry up. <laughs> 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 this poor old fella pushing his wife in a wheelchair. <laughs> across the oh. <laughs> And I didn't tell going, eh, 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 come on, yeah. I'll be somewhere. <laughs> oh, God, oh, I know dear. what you mean. That was a, I've that was done the same a, shit. When, I, when I'm like late moment. to a gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When I'm like late to a gig, I've been I've I've been like stuck in some ridiculous where there shouldn't be traffic, and you're like, there better be someone fucking dying up ahead. Dead, and then like yeah, literally, yeah. you get up ahead, and there's an ambulance. You're like, God, I'm a fucking asshole. <laughs> like, no, like, I know. I'm like that. I'm I'm just like a curse on both your houses. I'm not thinking. Oh, I hope, I hope nothing <laughs> awful's happened. I hope they're okay. I'm just like oh. somebody very fucking seriously injured to keep yeah. me waiting this long. <laughs> yes, and you can't Absolutely. believe it's gone. That's gone through your head, you know. Oh, I know. It's so yeah. fucking bad. What was it? Did you? What did you binge during quarantine? How did you guys handle that shit? Oh, I. What did I get into? I got into. Oh, you mean in terms of viewing stuff or just yeah, yeah, yeah. Alcoholic? There or anything? Like, did you handle oh. it creatively? Did you or did you? Just... <laughs> uh, no, no, I didn't actually. I, I, put, we put out two download singles uh, yeah. called um, "Be Wonderful" and "Guess Who's Sorry Now," but mm -hmm. we kind of just finished them just before the first lockdown of March 2020. Oh. And then no, um, a, a very short story version. It affected me really badly psychologically because after the first lockdown, I thought it was all the wrong thing to do. And mm -hmm. my, um, you know, I I just didn't agree with whilst paying every respect to the vulnerable and the elderly. Mm. And the stats are coming out here now here in the UK. All the studies are coming up that sadly for those people, any kind of virus like that is going to be very harmful for them and they've got to yeah. look after themselves. But for the rest of us, we could have gone about our daily business and the amount of people that have died because of lockdown, not because of COVID, because their cancer went unseen. The children, oh, there was that, a lot have of that, abused, yeah. children that have been abused and killed because they weren't at school, they're in an abusive household, the social worker wasn't able to see them. The, the damage that lockdown did to me was it just drove me insane and i was just kind of angry and drunk for about 18 months frankly so no wow. i wasn't yeah. productive and um i was just, I was just furious and um you know when and there was nothing i could do about it so i didn't achieve anything being like that and i know that but that's just the way i am i just so i just yeah. really so cross i couldn't get it out of my head but you know some of my friends <laughs> I've like produced a produced an album, written an album, and I'm sort of going, <laughs> "Oh, great! Oh, you fucking creep! You know, I hate positive people who <laughs> use the time productively. It makes me sick." <laughs> it's kind of funny because I listened um, to but, "Who's Sorry Now," and I was like, "Oh, she definitely made this during." But I, it's kind of funny that you guys did this <laughs> before the pandemic came out because I was like, it was kind of timely, especially the title. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Did we get what did we get? Guess it's sorry. No, I think we might no, actually we did that during the lock during the pandemic because there was a little gap where we were allowed to get together. Oh, okay. So I finished the vocal for that. But mm -hmm. be wonderful, which if people want to go to YouTube and just put into power be wonderful. Uh Ronnie and I got that finished, uh the vocal finished just before the first lockdown. And then he said, Why don't you get the kids to do a video for you in the garden? Because my kids have done um a course in creative media production so they can edit ah. and film and you know all that sort of stuff nice, nice. and uh, so we did it we we filmed uh, the video for be wonderful in the garden uh, with our chickens and our duck and our irish setter oh, and so great just just tried to be a little bit cheerful i was cheerful for one day making yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> everybody so now, gets i one. wasn't particularly yeah i wasn't particularly creative we did stuff like um we did stuff around the house really boring stuff you know, mm. we're decorating that needed doing and, you know, nothing exciting stuff. Uh, but in terms of going back to our favorite TV shows, I yeah. d dove into things that um, I hadn't really bothered with when they were out at the time. So we have um, a series over here called Midsummer Murders. Have you had that Ooh. in the States? No. no. Sounds great. So, do you know, what about Inspector Morse? No. no. Inspector Morse? Okay, oh, so let me think. How can I explain it to you? 
um well i know you i know you guys like uh, downton abbey don't you that's been a big yes, hit yes. Over in, in america it makes right? us so feel cultured not quite <laughs> well not quite that far back so midsummer murders i actually live in oxfordshire and okay. it's fictitious towns in the county of oxfordshire and and the same with inspector morse which was a huge huge series ran for over 10 years in the 80s mm -hmm. again set in oxfordshire and the dreaming spires of oxford so it's all this kind of really fictitious an England of yesteryear, you know, where everybody wears a hat and right. that kind of thing, you know. Okay, yeah. yeah. And um, and they were beautifully shot, and but the amount of people that die in these little villages, you'd never move there, you know. Mm. A bit like Miss Marple or Murder She Wrote. Okay. How many people can die in that fucking little town? <laughs> you know, it's worse than like you know, East LA or whatever. <laughs> Like right. That. So that kind of thing, and I just decided to go visit some um, iconic series, UK television series that I didn't watch at the time, and mm. that got me through a lot. Actually, again, you know, the kind of cozy blanket TV stuff. Yeah, yeah. We picked up on uh, first. It was just trash shit. Like I watched Tiger King uh, immediately. Oh that, yeah, I yeah. Knew, yeah, I had that over there. Um, oh, there we go. Fans yeah. of my girl loves bits of yeah. And he's a U.S. guy. Oh, he's a U.S. guy. That's cool. awesome. Yeah, I've yeah. got to look that up. It's probably I... on BBC Overseas or something, whatever you call it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff like that that we'll get. Sometimes I, some I have I have family in England, um, in Brighton, and uh, and Brighton I think. Oh, the gay. Chandler... Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know anything okay, about Brighton, right? but that's hilarious. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, I know. They live by the sea. I think I'm not sure. I'm like that's yeah. where my. Um, but it's that's beautiful. Great. Brighton is beautiful. Is it very gay? <laughs> I really. Oh, all right, all right. I'll have to let them know. Maybe they'll know. Yeah. I'll be like, listen, guys, you got to change your lifestyle. Too sweet. Uh, <laughs> you guys have been living the wrong fucking way in Brighton. <laughs> I have uh, a lot of pals in Brighton. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, who the hell else do I? I think somebody lives somewhere else in England. I don't fucking know. I think so. I'm like my family. I shouldn't even say it uh, because it's like <laughs> you're really not close to them, are you? Um, but uh, yeah, we watched um, like murder shit. Like uh, I don't, I don't know. If Midsummer Murders is like a TV show, or if it's like a documentary stuff. But I watched a lot of that. No, like, no, it's um, a TV show. Yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, true crime. <laughs> true crime. I got into a lot of that. Um, and in an unhealthy way, I think because I was just like, mm. like way too into like, like, it's weird to me because it's like those people live in your fucking area. You know what I mean? Like they're like, they're relatively yeah. normal, but that's what I wound up yes. getting into. And then like my old TV show stuff, like I love West Wing. So I watched that. Um, love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great show. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice to see a president, uh, that you can respect on television. <laughs> <laughs> Making yeah, our... the fictitious presidents are always better, aren't they? Aren't they? Harrison Ford is a great president. <laughs> he would make a great. <clears throat> you know, one of my favorite moments with him during uh, during Trump's presidency was uh, um, Donald Trump had made some weird comment about Harrison Ford in Air Force One, and then uh, Harrison Ford was being interviewed, and he was like, "What do you say to the president or whatever?" And he just turned to his camera and went, "Donald, it's a fucking movie." <laughs> he, was like, he was like leave the country relax like stop i thought i was gonna say believe. get off my plane <laughs> <laughs> that would have been even better holy shit i love um, that yeah I love well that. i want to plug your um your upcoming show so you have this something this sunday you said right with chris difford coming up oh no no sorry i misspoke 31st of march oh 31st of march um, okay we have yeah, we have a, 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 I live in a town called Henley on Thames in Oxfordshire, and we have a beautiful little theatre called the Kenton, and we're doing a concert for Ukraine. It's beautiful. And there's me and um, Nick Hayward. Um, nice. From, you know Nick Hayward? I do. Yeah, he's fabulous, a good friend of mine, and a couple awesome. of other local artists. And Chris is coming as well, we hope. He said he's going to poke his nose in, so that'll be fun. It's already oh, sold out, so, you know, that'll wow. be great. Oh, that's Raise great. some money, do a little bit of good, yeah. And, Absolutely. Will um, it be televised? Or, yeah, and or then I've got – they will live – they just sent an email to ask if they can live stream it. That's fine by me. Yeah, it's oh, absolutely great. fine by me. So I'm sure there'll be links up and stuff like that on my, my Twitter and things like Sweet. that. We'll plug that too. Which is just at – yeah. Oh, thank you. Which is at Carol Decker if you want to come looking for Twitter. And um, mm. 
then I've got lots of festivals across the summer. And, um, you know, if we've got any UK listeners um, interested, if you just go to the Facebook, which is um, to power forward slash Carol Decker, then you can see what gigs I've got. There's loads coming up. But nice. the, the most exciting thing is um, I've got a big tour across September and October of this year in the UK with Paul Young and Hugh and Cry, and that's called Essential 80s. So we're looking forward to that. So cool. That's awesome. Are you doing something with Nick Kershaw too, I saw, or is that past? The Nick Kershaw what? Are you, are you doing something with Nick Kershaw too, or did that pass? The uh, I, I thought I saw I'm something I'm always online. working with Nick. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah, I'm always working on with Nick because we do a lot of these. Um, it's like a these '80s things. There's big festivals, really big festivals. Um, this Friday, I'm jumping on a cruise with ABC, Tony Hadley from uh, Spanda Ballet. Yes. Uh, oh my Altered god. Images, Toya Wilcox. You know, so we we're always these little packet. The '80s thing is huge, and then at the end of the year. It's been delayed for two years now because of what happened. I'm mm -hmm. going across to Germany, Luxembourg, and Belgium and doing a thing called Night of the Proms, which, again, largely 80s artists, huge uh, orchestra, choir, oh, nice. and rock band, and you just jump in front and do a handful of your songs. It's absolutely awe-inspiring. You know, I, I've done a few huge orchestra gigs lately with the London Philharmonic and BBC Concert Orchestra and Opera North. And to sing your songs with a massive 70 piece orchestra is spine tingling, you know, wow. just yeah. to have all the strings from China in your hand be done by proper pizzicato violins and cellos and stuff uh, is just, oh, that's I really fucking myself cool. Every time I get to do it. Yeah. So a lot at the end of this year, my feet won't touch the ground. So I'll, I'll be moaning. I've got too much work having spent two years moaning. I didn't have any work, but yeah. I always find something <laughs> to moan about. My hobby. <laughs> That's what I did. You asked me what I did a lot of moment. <laughs> My husband spent a lot of time in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. That's great. Well, I just want to, I, I got, we have three questions left that we ask uh, every guest. So I'm just going to throw those at you real quick. Um, if you could go back in time and talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself today that would help you? that you're you are enough you're okay hmm. i used to have a lot of um you know um self-esteem issues um a lot of people do don't you you know yeah. you take a couple of knocks early in your life and they, they, they take effect quite quickly so i just say you're okay you're enough nice beautiful yeah. um and the second question is what had to end in your life good or bad that led you to where you are today uh to this moment in time <laughs> uh yeah yeah this moment right where you are yeah or in general yeah it doesn't necessarily have to be I... on dystopia with me because I, I don't want to know how you wound up here but <laughs> <laughs> i do um what had to end i would probably say and i say this with no relish or agenda i would ha probably have to say my relationship with ronnie otherwise i wouldn't have met my husband and had my children oh wow Nice. And I wasn't I wasn't happy about I wasn't happy about it at the time, but right. what came out of it was my husband and my children. So it, you know, this, it was meant to go a different way, and it did. Yeah, a great way worked out for the best. Yeah, and you yeah. guys are still collaborating, so that's sorry. even you sorry, know. Ron. Yeah, no, no, Ronnie's happily married, <laughs> two kids. Um, if you're watching, Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. Don't think you're fabulous. We actually have Ronnie here. Best thing you ever did was dump uh, me. Yeah. We, we just bring Ronnie into the frame. Yeah. <laughs> turns, turns into, but they thought Maury was canceled, didn't they? But he's not. He's back. Yeah. Um, that's all. And the last question is tied into the show. It's kind of a goofy question. But if this was a genuine dystopia, last day on Earth for everyone, zombies, aliens, comet heading toward the Earth, how would you uh, want to go out? What would be your epic death? Oh, God. A shit ton of cocaine, <laughs> and uh, which I just can't do anymore. You know, die. It doesn't matter if <laughs> right, you right. die, you can do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, <laughs> and a hu huge picture of margarita, ice cold margarita, glass with a salted rim. No, a cocaine a rim. Gack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cocaine. Oh, that's a. I never tried. That. That's I got you. I got you. We're gonna yeah. go out the same way so, together. 
<laughs> yeah so all the things that you're just not meant to do or can't do anymore because you know you're supposed to be mature grown-up parent and, uh, yeah. and who would want to do that anyway as a mature and responsible parent <laughs> but, <laughs> oh but if it God. doesn't fucking matter <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it <laughs> <laughs> completely i love that that was one of my favorite fucking answers ever Me so too. thank you that was great um well thank you so much for coming on uh you're come back anytime anytime you got anything going on or if you just want to say hi that'd be great yeah oh bless yeah we'll do because i know i can click on that link now i figured it out sorry about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> um <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> so bye lovely guys bye listeners hope you such a pleasure it. great meeting bye. you right. yeah it's such a pleasure see you soon bye meeting you too. Peace. Bye -bye. Bye. Dystopia tonight.